Just a forewarning, in this episode of Icons, I'll be covering topics such as drug abuse and suicide, and I'll be pulling quotes from the man who has a rich but rather raw vocabulary, so there will be swearing throughout the show. And with that said, let's begin. One minute I was standing next to a deep fryer, and the next I was watching the sunset over the Sahara. I realised that one thing led directly to the other. Had I not taken a dead-end dishwashing job, I would have never become a cook. Had I not become a cook, I would have never become a chef. Had I not become a chef, I wouldn't have been able to fuck up so spectacularly. Had I not known what it was like to really fuck up, that obnoxious but wildly successful memoir I wrote wouldn't have been half as interesting. And I'm not going to tell you here how to live your life. I'm just saying, I guess, that I got very lucky. And this is a quote from Anthony Bourdain at the start of a documentary that I watched about him, and I'll tell you all about that shortly. Anthony Bourdain is, of course, a famous chef, writer, and TV host, producer. He's a multidisciplined, multi-talented artist. I'm very excited about today's episode. I actually spent much of the lockdowns back in 2020 uh, watching episodes of Parts Unknown which is uh, one of Anthony Bourdain's TV shows. And I remember watching it with my brother. We watched episodes like uh, Sicily, uh, Cuba, Okinawa, Congo even. You can imagine during a time like uh, the lockdowns in 2020 when travel was inaccessible to us, having Anthony Bourdain as a guide uh, to the adventures, the food, culture, and you know the human condition that can be experienced when traveling the world was deeply enriching. A bit of escapism, sure, but very meaningful. And those episodes really have stayed with me because they were my form of travel at that time. Anthony Bourdain has a childhood friend called Jeff Formosa who says that was his talent. He made everything sound better than it really was. He made you want to be there. Who was Anthony Bourdain? I mean, obviously, he's a cook, uh, turned writer, turned TV host and producer. But when I studied him for this episode, I realized he's a very complicated artist. You know, I actually spent much of my preparation time for this podcast feeling quite conflicted even. You know, was he was he cool? Was he authentic? You know, how was he able to sound so profound about reality? Or perhaps was he actually disillusioned by at least his version of it? But in delving deep, into his life and work through two interesting vehicles, I found some truly fascinating insights for us to take away and allow to inspire us on our artistic journey. And those two vehicles are a unique book by Laurie Wooliver called Bourdain in Stories, which is not actually a biography. You know, usually I'd read a biography for these, but this is actually a collection of thoughts from almost a hundred of those who knew him best. And this was all collected by Anthony Bourdain's longtime assistant. She only really is featured in the introduction to the book, but the rest of the book is just literally conversations pulled from the interviews that she conducted with these hundred people or so. And it's a fantastic format. You know, I really enjoyed it because although it's quite hard to trace where you are at some points in his story, um, it's amazing to read so many different perspectives and to see the conflicting nature of some people remembering an event going one way, some people remembering it another way. But it's a fantastic method of learning about an artist because you get so many perspectives. So I hope to find and come across a similar format with other artists who have books written about them. Alongside that, this other vehicle that I used was actually this incredible documentary called Roadrunner, a film about Anthony Bourdain. And it was made by the filmmaker Morgan Neville who I also recommend um, looking into his work. He has some fantastic documentaries, but I remember watching Roadrunner a few years ago when it came out and it really hits deeply. It's a very interesting documentary that explores different parts and highlights of Anthony Bourdain's life. But the combination of both the documentary and the book, uh, Bourdain in Stories, really made for fantastic research period. So in this special episode of Icons, which of course is a podcast where we look at the process and philosophy behind the works by the greatest artistic masters. We're going to cover the insights derived from the artistic label Bourdain might have given himself if he was braver. We'll also cover his work ethic, how his heroes inspired his adventure-filled lifestyle, his TV career and the creative freedom that he found in it, his requirement for the best quality of art. I can't wait to get into this particular subject. And we'll finish on the complicated nature of his view on reality. So let's get into it. 
into how Andy Bourdain crafted his art, for which there is a lot. And as always, all the art I mentioned throughout the episode is actually listed in the description. So there's no need to frantically Google everything that I mention as you listen. Just sit back, listen, and afterwards you can scroll the description in order to find each piece of art that I reference. Whenever I talk about Anthony Bourdain to people, they mostly either know him as a travel show host or as a chef. But when you discover, as I did, that throughout his artistic career, he wrote 13 books and, you know, not all nonfiction at that, you start to see that perhaps what he saw himself as, at first at least, was really a writer. And immediately I want to go to a Patrick Radden Keefe quote. Um, Patrick Radden Keefe was actually a New Yorker writer who profiled Tony in 2017. And he said, when Tony talked about his early days as a writer, one of the big questions in my mind was, you hear this story that Tony has told a million times. All he ever wanted to be is a chef. He worked his way through kitchens. He's got a crew that collects around him. They're total badasses. Their biggest ambition is to work on one perfect brunch shift. But he made it sound as though he wasn't hustling all that time to get out of the kitchen. I didn't buy it instinctively. What I wondered was, were you a frustrated writer all that time? And he basically said he wasn't. So I went then to NYU to find the archives of Between C and D, the downtown zine that he wrote for. You know, I want to take a moment just to note this this question that that Patrick Radden Keefe, you know, had in his mind, which is, were you a frustrated writer all that time? And it's a theme that I want to kind of explore here because it really did seem that perhaps Anthony Bourdain, of course, was a chef. He worked in kitchens, but really, perhaps was this a mask for his true ambitions, even something to fall back on and say, you know, I wasn't really trying to be a writer. I was always wanting to be a chef or a cook. That's a question that's posed by Patrick Radden Keefe here and something I think was worth further exploring. So I found a continuation of this quote, which says, there's all these letters from young Tony to Joel Rose, where he's so fucking hungry. I've gotten these emails from people. I used to write these emails myself. It's the young writer who is trying to sound brash and casual, but is actually super needy and wants affirmation, playing it cool, but hitting the jokes a little too hard. And it's all those things that I didn't associate with Tony, but he was that guy. Joel Rose actually is someone I wanted to look into and and the book beautifully provided me with lots of examples from him because he was this friend of Tony's when Tony was younger and was aspiring to be a writer. There's a great quote here by Joel Rose who says, I don't want to say that he looked up to me, but he trusted me. He talked a lot about his insecurities as a writer. Can I do this? Do I have anything to say? While he had insecurities about his writing, he was a good writer right from the start. He had a voice that he could access. And, you know, when you read Anthony Bourdain's first nonfiction book, Kitchen Confidential, you never really read the words of a first time writer. You know, this is this is a man who fills his work with words that you assume come from a rich history of writing. You know, I'm actually drawn to a quote here by Helen Lang, who was a college friend of Tony's. And, you know, just keep in mind that throughout this podcast, more unusually, there's going to be a huge variety of people from whom I quote. And unless I'm really emphasizing the person, don't feel that you need to be keeping track of everyone that I've mentioned here, because it's really about the overall profile that we create about Tony. This is the person we're exploring ultimately. But Helen Lang, the college friend of Tony, said he worked really hard. It takes a lot of determination to wake up early in the morning and write and then go to a job in the kitchen and come home at God knows what hour and get up the next morning and do it again. He was a fiend. One time he said about his disciplined writing regimen, such was my lust to see my name in print. He threw himself into his work in a manner that I found astonishing. By the way, I absolutely love this word fiend, you know, to describe someone's work ethic. What a great way to describe it. You know, a kind of primal energy, you know, fiend-like energy. I love that. Um, and, and you know, I, I want to make a side note here that Whilst I did open the previous episode of Icons on Hayao Miyazaki, the animator, by touching on his infamous work ethic, that's uh, episode two, by the way, I feel I didn't spend enough time really talking about how ingrained and important that quality was. And it's really true of Anthony Bourdain as well here. I would almost say that you, you can't really be prolific without it. 
you know, it seems that for some people it's like this constant force that can't be stopped, you know, and, and it's almost like it doesn't matter what, what they work on at any particular time because they're always in motion, like Tony working in the kitchens, you know, he's always in motion and moving towards becoming a writer and given enough time, you know, they're bound to discover their work because of that intensity that they put behind what they do. I think that's true of all artists. And, you know, immediately I'm drawn to a quote by Jay-Z that I absolutely love where he says, put me anywhere on God's green earth, I'll triple my worth. He's uh, perhaps talking about it from the consumerist lens, but at least you can understand that this is the intention to say, you know, work ethic will help me find the thing that is important and meaningful, no matter where you put me on God's green earth. I also just, just to kind of back up this point about Tony, you know, I think of this clip in the documentary that shows Tony, you know, in the morning and what looks like his PJs, I imagine. And he's not even dressed yet. He's lighting a cigarette and he's pointing over towards his desk and he, and he talks about doing exactly this every day. He'd, he'd roll out of bed, light a cigarette, and he'd start writing right away before he's even brushed his teeth. And the learning we can kind of take from this right away is that, you know, whatever it is that you love, just start at it in the morning. Get to it. You know, here I am right now recording this podcast early in the morning for exactly that reason. I'm trying to emulate at least uh, Anthony Bourdain's, you know, ability to just get right at it straight away. And I think that this vehicle of work ethic was something that others around him recognized as well. The owner of Les Hales, um, Philip Lajani, who is someone who features a lot and I, and I really loved a lot of his perspective. So he is someone to remember. So he was the owner of Les Hale, which is one of the kitchens that, that Tony worked in and, and actually was working in at the time that Kitchen Confidential, his book came out. But uh, he notes after the release of that book that, you know, Tony was always behind on his rent, living paycheck to paycheck. So when there was this opportunity, he was ready. And I love that point there. He was not just that he was living paycheck to paycheck, but I think this also hints to what that drove in him, you know, the desire to be ready at all times, be writing at all times. And, and I think this really contributed to his success as an artist. Now, if you didn't know much about Anthony Bourdain's history of writing, I bet you didn't know that Tony was also originally a fiction writer. I think very few people know this about him. And actually, his first two published books were detective novels, which pulled from what he knew and were set against the restaurant backdrop. So again, you can imagine this as well. He's working in the kitchens and he actually wrote two novels in that time. And they were Bone in the Throat and Gone Bamboo. We'll later learn that the lifestyle of the detective in the novels was likely what he was drawn to when he was writing these. But we'll, we'll come back to that idea, at least about his lifestyle and so on. But I love there's this uh, episode of Parts Unknown uh, that features in Cuba. Tony actually spends time with this writer of a detective series called Leonardo Padura. And, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic moment where you can see Tony's excitement. He never actually mentions that he wrote two um, detective books and actually some detective comics as well later based on those books um, in his life. He never mentions those, but he, you can see the excitement as he's you know, with someone who does it professionally for a living, pulls from Cuba as a resource in order to tell great stories. You know, it's a, it's a lovely moment there. There are these two brothers uh, called the Stone Brothers, Webb Stone and Rob Stone, I believe, who were kind of these pitching and writing partners. And, you know, they were actually the ones that tried to pitch Tony to move from fiction into nonfiction. I've got a great quote here from Webb Stone who says, you're missing where the gold is. The gold is the stuff you think is throwaway, that you're indenting and you're putting in freaking italics. That's where you are. And again, there's this great insight here about removing the filters between the audience and your unique edge. You know, Rob Stone and Webb Stone recognized that Tony's unique edge was his voice, his authentic voice. And it's something we've, we've come to know so dearly through his TV shows and obviously his nonfiction work. But you know, at the time he was only writing fiction. So to recognize that in him when he was only writing fiction is firstly amazing from the part of Webstone and Robstone. But, you know, there's a real lesson here and that you may find for yourself even that your art is actually a step away from your own unique edge, your own voice. And I know that's true of me. Uh, when, when I started and wanted a creative outlet, you know, I actually was making a YouTube channel and the format of YouTube is the thing that matters less here. And the thing that mattered about this was that 
I was actually writing scripts and I was, I was writing a script that, that I would read from as it was this kind of video essay format. But one thing to note was that I would then send that video to a few of my friends and I recall some of them catching on that I'd made this, but some of them didn't even recognize me in it. They felt like it was a good video essay, but they couldn't hear my voice in it. They couldn't, they didn't even recognize one person literally didn't reply because they thought that I just sent them some random person's video as opposed to my own creation. And it's funny because part of me was flattered by the fact that they thought my work was good enough to sit amongst those who were also creating video essays on YouTube. But what it was missing was my unique edge, the thing that made what I do interesting and unique, which is my voice, which is whenever I read about someone or learn about a particular artist and their art and the process behind it and the passion that I have when I talk about it, it's that real authentic voice that I have that you're hearing now, you know, that only comes off of what I have here, which is just a, a sheet of quotes that I've pulled from the book and notes that I have for myself. But, you know, I'm speaking authentically and organically. And I think that it was important for me to find that and it eventually arrived at a place where I'm creating the podcast that you're listening to now. But, you know, I didn't have that initially when I was writing these scripts and reading from them. And the result was that it was my voice, sure, but it was not the unique version of my voice that you're hearing right now. But when Webb told Tony about this, he actually recalls Tony being quite scared by this. He said that by writing nonfiction and suddenly making his stories that were set in the restaurant world real, he'd actually risk never being able to eat lunch in this town again, I think referring to the kind of chefs that maybe he wanted to, you know, take shots at in his work and maybe exposing part of the world that other chefs or people who worked in kitchens didn't want exposed. He felt perhaps there was something to fear here. You know, another insight here is that in these extreme emotions like fear, you know, something we've even covered in the first episode with 50 Cent, where we talked about anger being an extreme emotion to pull from, but here it's fear. You know, we, we should really look in these extreme emotions for art because this is likely where art is sitting for us. Fear particularly is interesting because it's likely that when we fear something, it's because we have something meaningful and unique to say. And I know this is definitely true of Anthony Bourdain, but another person I think of is uh, Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino, who naturally I will be doing an episode on. But, you know, what I will say is that, you know, when he talks about whether work is good or not, or he later reflects that when work is good enough, when art is good enough, the criticism of the messaging or tone within the work isn't really remembered. It's actually the conversation that's remembered, that is encouraged by the art. You know, I, I love this idea that, you know, you can make your work controversial. In fact, I probably shouldn't even use the word controversial. I can imagine Quentin Tarantino having a problem with that word. You know, for him, it wasn't about creating controversy. It was about creating conversations. Controversy is almost like a a, a lazy word we use to get to some surface conclusion about the conversation as opposed to really being engaged deeply with the conversation. And naturally, you know, Quentin Tarantino's work is very good. It's of a high, high level. And I think that is found for him in creating those conversations. So, you know, do look for fear uh, in your work and the things that you might be scared of. So to Anthony Bourdain writes this 2000 word essay about the restaurant business that would first become a New Yorker story titled Don't Eat Before Reading This. And by the way, if you're going to read any of his work and you've never read any of Anthony Bourdain's written work, I would start here. It's going to be linked in the show notes, of course. But this, this, um, this piece called Don't Eat Before Reading This. It was first sent by Tony, unsolicited, to the Downtown Express, a Tribeca-based community newspaper whose editors actually rejected it. And then he later sent it to this New York, um, he then sent it to another paper called the New York Press, where it got in front of this guy called Sam Sifton. And Sam Sifton was actually an editor at New York Press. And he mentions, uh, I've got a quote here from him where he mentions that the essay landed and I read it and it was great. It was perfect. It was everything. It was picking up a rock off the restaurant scene and showing everything that was underneath it. I love that, by the way. I'm just going to repeat that. It was picking up a rock off the restaurant scene and showing everything that was underneath it. And it was telling the truth. And it seemed to me to be really important, exciting, funny, brash, profane, and above all, incredibly readable. Tony was a clean writer. <laughs> 
what an amazing surmising almost of the qualities that makes up Anthony Bourdain's written work. Exciting, important, funny, brash, profane, and incredibly readable or incredibly digestible in the format of TV. Um, I love that Sam Sifton recognizes this in him. A similar compliment is given to his writing from Rob Stone, who is the brother of Webb Stone, who we mentioned earlier, who said he wrote with this clear eyed, simple style. He wasn't trying hard and it wasn't self conscious. But this quote was actually about his fiction work. So the fact that he already had this quality within his fictional work, which translated so organically to his non-fiction work, really speaks to the testament of his skill here. This piece did go from being okayed as a cover story at the New York Press by Sam Sifton to Russ Smith, who I believe was the head editor at the time, coming back from a holiday and then killing the story. You know, Sam Sifton recalls that he still doesn't know why this happened, but he says... But I will tell you, I've dined out on the story a million times. I liked that story when it was a New York press story. I liked that story when it was a New Yorker story. I liked that story when it became the book. And that's right, this essay actually became expanded into the book that made Tony famous, Kitchen Confidential. And I love this format, by the way. It's almost like the MVP of a business idea, you know, the minimal viable product, which is that you take, you know, not the full version of the business idea in, in its full totality, but rather you try and bring it down to its simplest essence, the thing that you almost need to test and make true in order to, you know, see the time and investment for the full version. So don't just work straight on that full version, but go to that simplest idea first and then test it in the market and see how people will respond. That's the MVP idea in, in business. They kind of did this for the writing. You know, Tony wrote an essay for what would later become his book, but he didn't go straight away and write the book. He tested the idea, saw the response, and, and the essay did do incredibly well. It was a very popular essay. And so they kind of took this reaction and justified and okayed being able to publish a full book. So perhaps we can do a similar thing with our art. If you feel that you have some grand vision, some big idea, you know, perhaps see if you can distill it down to a simplest idea and test it. And of course, this is a, perhaps a more commercial lens to the artistic process. Um, you know, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, at least in its mass appealed nature when it comes to creating art. So, you know, with all these insights that I cover in, in icons, don't feel that you have to apply all of them to your work. In fact, do examine each and every one of them with your own artistic lens and your own perspective. But I do find this one to be particularly insightful when it comes to being able to test something that perhaps you are scared of, you have some fear around, and this might actually help to remove that fear. So I just love that approach. And I've got a quote here from Tony himself, who said to a news reporter after the book came out, I was in a cranky mood after my last restaurant closed and felt no reason not to tell the truth about a business I both love and uh, have mixed emotions about. Which is a quote I'm noting here because it contrasts his fear that he had, the, or at least that Webb Stone recalls that he had before he ever wrote nonfiction. But, you know, Tony does this a lot. He retrofits a story over his decisions. He is a storyteller after all. And I even noted this about Hayao Miyazaki in the previous episode, that these, a lot of these artists are storytellers. So the way they talk about the process and the way they talk about how they came to a decision is often not a full reflection of the reality, but rather a version of reality that they like to tell, whether it's to their audience or to themselves. But I will do the best I can to try and differentiate the truth between the real process that happened and their perspective of it. But whilst he did tell a lot of stories, he also wanted his life to be a story. And where did this desire for his life to be a story come from, or perhaps more accurately, be enabled by? Well, Tony mentions that his first heroes were musicians and writers because they were the people who could go on adventures no matter how antisocial they were, but they could make something beautiful out of it. And I think that is a great reflection on and prediction on Anthony Bourdain's work. He says this before he becomes the world-renowned TV presenter that he eventually became. But I think you can see that musicians and writers, you know, what's interesting about them to him is that they could have these really messy lives and yet everything would become a story. Perhaps even Anthony Bourdain's own journey of becoming a chef working in kitchens, 
was likely also a means for him to gather stories for himself in order to be able to write from. So really, he probably was a frustrated writer, as the uh, New York profiler first mentions. You know, perhaps he really was this frustrated writer, but he placed himself in situations where he could create stories and live adventures. Also, just this note here about him being antisocial, you know, despite how TV might later show him to be, Tony was definitely an antisocial cat. But despite these original influences mentioned by Tony, having read the book about him, I actually now believe that the title for first influence on Bourdain's approach to lifestyle and adventure goes to a comic book character. Uh, Christopher, Anthony Bourdain's brother, uh, mentions that Tony and him used to read The Adventures of Tantan, or Tintin as you may know him in the West, but the French name is Tantan. And these were a series of books about journalist characters who travelled around the world and had lots of adventures. I do recommend reading The Adventures of Tantan if you can. Uh, I remember reading a few when I was a child in the bookshops. They were these beautifully illustrated comic books. Um, each one was set in a different location. It almost does look like the origination of the TV shows that Anthony Bourdain would later make, you know, of being in a different location each time. But this contrasted with Tony's lack of actual travel that he did when he was a child. Um, perhaps encouraging Tony to create ideas of travelling in his mind. There are two characters here that I'll mention that are worth noting, Lydia Tenaglia and Chris Collins, who were this creative TV partner duo who worked with Tony throughout his TV shows. And they both noted that when they first travelled with Tony on a TV show called A Cook's Tour, that it was evident that Tony had never really done any travelling before, um, Lydia actually goes to mention that Tony's view of the world had emanated from books and from films. Almost in an encyclopedic way, he could grab all these references, and I think he was excited to go on this journey to see if reality matched his imagination. But then Lydia mentions that it was almost like Tony saying, I wanted to check out these places that loom large in my mind from the things I've read and the, the films I've seen. We will come back to this when talking particularly about his work in TV and how he actually leveraged these references that he stored up in him for his art. But Tonton actually reappears later in his life when he's working at a kitchen and he at this point wanted to be a cartoonist. It's hard to trace exactly in his lineage or his story where exactly he wanted to be a cartoonist but I believe it to be almost at the same time that he was originally writing fiction work and you know, he was always doing caricatures of people from the kitchens or sometimes in the restaurant um, on the walls in the kitchen. And, you know, the bathroom at Gianni's was almost like a gallery of portraits of all the staff. Uh, a colleague of Anthony Bourdain at Gianni's can be quoted here because he says, because Tony would go into the bathroom to get high probably and to do a cartoon of me spilling soup. Gianni's, by the way, is a large Italian restaurant that Tony ran and in Kitchen Confidential, he actually mentions this, but he refers to it with this pseudonym name of Gino's, I believe. To continue with, with James Graham, he says he put all of his energy into cartooning. It wasn't until after the time when we were working at La Dolce Vita on 13th Street. At that time, Tony was starting to lose faith in his cartooning. We would look at the Tonton comics together. I remember I found a book of Herge's work, Herge obviously being Tonton's creator, and I brought it in and we looked at it together and Tony said, yeah, this is why I can never make it as a cartoonist. I'm just not this good. I can't compete with this. And whilst there is this separate point to be made here about him internally almost giving up on his dream of cartooning, there is a point to be made here that he held Tantan in high regard, both from an artistic standpoint, but also more likely as some kind of model story of how he wanted to live his life. But yeah, you know, I should go back to that idea that, you know, he clearly admired people who were incredibly talented. And this is something you can see a lot in his in his shows and in his interviews. But perhaps his admiration turned to an over romanticization a theme that unfortunately does plague Tony's thoughts, you know, but he has this over romanticization of these figures that made them inaccessible to him, like Harrogate's work. There's a subtle and important example of this in the Budapest episode 
of Tony's uh, travel show Parts Unknown. And he's having dinner with a very famous cinematographer from the 70s um, called Villamos Zygamond. And he helped shoot films like Close Encounter of a Third Kind, Deer Hunter, The Long Goodbye. So, you know, he was prolific and, and, and very talented. But, you know, after originally being satisfied by Villamos's explanation for his cinematic style, there, there, there's this dinner setting in this episode where they're talking about his cinematic style, where he uses the term poetic realism. And I'll never forget that because, you know, I think it speaks also to Anthony Bourdain's lens and why he probably enjoyed listening to that so much is he has this idea of poetic realism I think within his work where the beauty within realism is kind of emphasized and poeticized so it's shooting realism but with this poetic lens I, I, I love that but he is dissatisfied with Villamos revealing later that he did well in school and he attributed his skills to proper study of mathematics and I'll read you this conversation they have Villamos says but tell me what would you like to hear and Bourdain quickly responds with I was touched by God I don't know if you were creating the sublime I'm looking for the metaphysical answer but then Villamos answers him very sharply and says we learned this we learn to be an artist which I love you know he he's immediately dispelling look I wasn't born this way and I, I wasn't encountering God you know I was learning skills and I was applying skills which is a beautiful notion because you could almost accuse me of this notion of over romanticizing and idolizing artists by creating a podcast and calling these artists icons but once you listen to an episode you find out that I'm actually trying to make these people accessible to find the part of them that is relatable and what actually helped them create the art rather than to like simply hold up their art as some mystical product that arrived into the world perfectly. You, you might notice in these episodes, I don't spend too much time just talking about the different bits of art. I'm really trying to understand the person behind the art and find the human relatable part of them. And what could make Tony more relatable than his quality of being a nerd? You know, ultimately, I did have that quote earlier from Lydia Tanaglia, who said, you know, he was pulling his worldview from books and films. But, you know, his brother actually says it was fun being with Tony in these early days in the 1980s. Probably to this day, he was one of the foremost scholars in the United States on the Kennedy assassination. He knew so damn much. He was always reading. You know, Chris actually then talks about his dad, who, like Tony, liked reading biographies and history books and knowing immense amounts of interesting shit. This reminds me of Hayao Miyazaki from episode two, who was also always reading. And this obsession for him gave him an incredible foundational well from which he could pull from at any time. Joel Rose, that first writer friend that I earlier mentioned, he said he was always so brilliant. He was so sharp. He was a catalogue of stuff that was astonishing. He would just entertain me. I actually immediately think of friends who are like this. And, you know, some currently have an untapped brilliance about them. This like unique spark that shines whenever they're you know four pages deep into some wikipedia researching something that almost has no relevance to their profession and you know whilst you don't need to monetize that or make it public or make art from it i do wonder sometimes if the world would be slightly better if more of those people did feel that they could be unapologetic and public about their nerd-like passions an example of someone who does this well is a friend of mine who has a YouTube channel and he's so unapologetically nerdy about cars. The channel is actually called Not Economically Viable and I highly recommend it just to see someone who is really displaying their unique edge. They're really displaying their nerdiness and his passion just shines. He's given himself the permission to be so authentically this version of himself and I think is becoming very successful because of exactly this unfiltered quality. A colleague of, of Tony's who worked in the kitchen, Hilary Snyder, says that it wasn't exactly clear when I first met Tony, but it did become clear from hanging out with him that he was so much more multidimensional than your average chef. He was just so much broader than that. He had this interest in literature and culture and life in general, but he just embodied that global citizen thing before he had all his stamps on his passport and 
the insight here, I think, is, is to really zoom out and take a larger view of the world. You know, my dad often talks about people who he's drawn to, who are these kind of worldly people, you know, people whose country of origin isn't so obvious because they aren't tied to it. And they're also embodying this larger perspective of the world. And I think of a quote from Balthazar Gracian, who was an Italian writer that I love, who says, belie your national defects. No country, even the most civilized, is free from some national failing when neighboring countries will always criticize either for advantage or solace. It's a skillful triumph to conceal these national faults. And an additional insight, of course, is that Tony was able to do this even before he started traveling the world. But once he does start traveling, he has this great quote where he says, if I'm an advocate of anything, it's to move as far as you can, as much as you can, across oceans or simply across the river. Walk in someone else's shoes or at least eat their food. It's a plus for everyone. And boy, did he travel. But when we look at the beginnings of his travels, we can actually observe the growing of a new spark within Tony. The second location that Tony went to on his first TV show, A Cook's Tour, was actually in Vietnam. And it was here Tony was beginning to get into his groove. The documentary actually presents this moment where you can see Bourdain communicating, directing even, something that he was criticised for not doing well in the first Japan episode. Um, and he's, he's doing this to try and find the perfect scene. And his charm and humour that we kind of later get to see in his later episodes began to show its head. You know, Lydia describes this as a time where the show kind of changed gear. And I want to bring back someone who I said is going to be important, Philip Lejeune, um, the owner of Les Hales, the kitchen where Tony worked as an executive chef. You know, he came to Vietnam to join this trip. He actually noted that he saw a happier, less cynical Bourdain to the one that he knew back in the kitchen. The two of them then actually kind of had mutual falling in love with the place. And Philip says he was in a way not in paradise, but he was in the world he wanted to be in. I had never seen anyone happy like this except a four-year-old to whom you give his first bicycle. It was unbelievable and the whole trip was absolutely magical. I also want to pull a quote from Tony about his thoughts on Vietnam. He says, I love Vietnam. Maybe it's a pheromonic thing, like when you meet the love of your life for the first time. She just somehow inexplicably smells and feels right. You sense that given the opportunity this is the woman you want to spend the rest of your life with. And wow, what a way to describe a place. Uh, Philip is actually in the documentary and he mentions that Apocalypse Now is, you know, one of Tony's top three movies because it combined Vietnam, the war and the book The Heart of Darkness, which, you know, as a side note, I love that Philip was such a good friend to Tony that he could actually recount the various reasons why Tony Bourdain loved something. And this isn't necessarily an insight for improving your art, but definitely a life lesson we should take away, which is to kind of know someone so well to become such good friends that you can actually talk about exactly why they love something, even when they're not present. And so Vietnam was almost this mythical place for Tony because of its present nature in Apocalypse Now. There's a side note I want to make about it, which is that um, Robert Volo, who was a, another kitchen colleague of, um, of Tony's in New York, said that, we were all into movies together. We had a tape of the soundtrack of Apocalypse Now going in the kitchen for months. You know, Tony loved films, but clearly he also wanted to be in them. This actually reminds me of when I worked at a kitchen in a Turkish kebab shop and they used to play, you know, the Turkish news and Turkish dramas in the background all the time. But uh, there was this one shift that I managed to convince the person I was working with if we could play the Godfather 2 soundtrack. So clearly this was me wanting to live in a place. It is, of course, strange to be playing a soundtrack based on Italian culture whilst in a Turkish kebab shop. But, you know, nevertheless, it definitely reflected my mood that I wanted to create and the world that I wanted to live in whilst I was working there and, and doing that shift. That will always be a very special memory for me. But I think this love of film and being in film in Tony Bourdain was very important as he started to be inspired 
and create what was effectively self-indulgent film references in the TV shows, which helped him begin to realize that filmmaking could actually be fun. You know, I think he was a little bit put aside by it at the beginning, but he really became to love it. And he calls the art of filmmaking actually a big crayon box, which I love. Chris Collins actually speaks of him at this moment, kind of seeing that that Tony could actually have fun with this and that he could create something that has meaning. And again, it's here, I'll make that reference that I made before about how you know, he could grab all these references. And I think he was excited to go on this journey to see if the reality matched his imagination. You know, I think that very much comes from from his desire of film and so on. But then let's cut to being in Bangkok where they're filming another episode. And it's a place where the guys only had 24 hours to film a show. And this is where Bourdain is seen to direct by being direct. He says, shoot, I'm going to have a blast. No retakes catch it in the edit. There's a quote from Anthony Bourdain here that I'll pull which says, I'm a big believer in winging it. I'm a big believer that you're never going to find the perfect city travel experience or the perfect meal without a constant willingness to experience a bad one. Letting a happy accident happen is what a lot of vacation itineraries miss, I think, and I'm always trying to push people to allow these things to happen rather than to stick to some rigid itinerary. This actually reminds me of uh, Adam McKay, who was the director of The Big Short and uh, the first episode of Succession, who noted that he doesn't like it when things go too well, too close to the script and so on. He says he gets nervous if there hasn't been a happy accident or some improv that can allow for that pleasant surprise in the editing room that you just can't plan for. And so the insight here is definitely to allow yourself to be free of your process sometimes. You know, if you found you've got some routine or some perfect way in order to create your art loosen up you know go the long way around make mistakes on purpose or as Anthony Bourdain says catch it in the edit uh, Chris Collins then again notes that what started to grow at this moment was this understanding of Tony you don't need to tell us everything you need to experience this and ask questions that's how we're going to learn from this place it's not you being a travel guide it's you being open to experience and of course the intro to the voiceover to cook's tour reflects exactly this mindset he says i'm looking for extremes of emotion and experience i'll try anything i'll risk everything and just a note here on on the voiceover this was actually originally written by lydia and chris which kind of helped to set the context you know i'm talking about voiceover for the whole show you know it helped to set the context for each scene but then tony began to edit it slowly and surely before arriving at a place where Lydia referred to him being maniacal about it, you know, recognizing that it was ultimately an extension of him, right? And his voice. So he should be exactly that maniacal about it. It is his voice after all. But then let's contrast this with Karen Rinaldi, who was the book editor and publisher, noting that Tony once told her that he'd never do TV and that it would be him being a big sellout and that she should shoot him if he ever did it. Kim Witherspoon, his literary agent, also notes that prior to Kitchen Confidential, he pretty much thought himself as a non-fiction writer. Although we, we all know that he really wanted to be a fiction writer at the beginning. So there's another insight that's worth noting as a point to be open to new mediums, to kind of stay fluid when choosing an art form to express your creative perspective. You know, don't tell yourself like Tony did, you know, I'm a writer or I'm a chef because it may stop you from being able to add other titles like TV producer or cartoonist or singer or painter. You know, Tony later says, making TV was becoming creatively satisfying. I wrote the book, A Cook's Tour, and yet continued filming. The tail now wagged the dog. I was hooked on travel, on seeing the world, and on the terms I was seeing it. I was on the road for a better part of two years, during which everything in my life changed. I stopped working as a chef, a job whose daily routines have always been the only thing that stood between me and chaos. But it was once Tony started exploring this chaos in his pursuit with TV, that a sort of creative freedom and a demanding of the best from people started to arrive in his style. Because once he got into it, once he found what he could create, he didn't want anything less. 
There's a quote from an editor that he worked with named Mustafa Gagat, who said, so I'd been working on No Reservations for like two weeks. No Reservations is the second TV show he worked on after Cook's Tour and before he worked on Parts Unknown. Tony wanted to have a meeting with like everyone who worked in post-production. So we gathered together in this little conference room and he proceeded to tell everyone to ignore the network. He said, completely ignore everything they're saying about music, about story, about shots. Let me deal with it all. I'm going to make the show I want to make across all fronts. Now, naturally, this is a risk. It can sound very dictatorial and depending on who you're working with, it might create real conflicts with people who might even leave. So just, just keep that in mind. But this did actually end up empowering people like Mustafa. So there is a risk, but there is a possible reward as well, which Mustafa reflects on when he says everyone is always just trying to make the network happy. That's how production companies stay in business, by making the network happy. For me, it was the beginning of understanding how Tony empowered his team using a kind of military style band of brothers approach. He demanded the ultimate loyalty and he gave it back in return. And this is an excellent insight into how Tony worked. You know, uh, Pat Young, who was the president and GM of the Travel Channel that Bourdain had his TV show on at the time. And Pat Young said he was prepared to piss off everybody. He was going to make sure that we knew what he had to say and let him say it. We agreed with him that there would be no product integration and that he would have to sign off on any sort of correlated marketing propositions. His personal integrity was important to him. We weren't to do anything that was going to compromise that. You know, immediately here with that structuring of a deal almost, it reminds me of uh, Christopher Nolan, who famously demanded a deal structure recently that gave him total control and an obscene budget for production and marketing. And I think almost 20% of the first dollar gross. But, you know, despite how much he negotiated in terms of royalties, the first part is actually very crucial to making it lucrative. You know, he has to have the total creative control and budget in order for him to see his vision through. You know, people go and see Christopher Nolan's vision, his film, undiluted. And this is really what he was ultimately demanding. And this is exactly what Tony Bourdain was demanding. You know, Pat Young continues in this quote where he says, I think you can get quite cynical in television. You can get in a sort of place where that's good enough. And for Tony, good enough wasn't good enough. He really did raise the game and that's why the show stood out. But with that creative freedom came Tony's demands for high standards. Nari Kai, who's a producer director that he worked with, says, whenever I was around Tony, I felt like I had to be on. He made us do our homework and he always had this grand idea in his mind. But sometimes those demands can come through in these now infamous emails. And I'll give you some examples. You know, he wrote this one email to Chris Collins, the producing partner he had saying aspiring to mediocrity this is a grim inevitable and all too predictable trajectory to the passage of a good television episode people aren't as stupid as your minions clearly believe don't empower these squirrel bald nerds by letting them get their way they will then nibble this show to death like hungry ducks as always best wishes and respect Tony, which is a hilarious way to end such an email. And uh, Helen Cho, who was a producer who worked with Chris and Lydia and Tony, said it bothered him if everyone liked the show. He was like, it should create conversation. So, you know, that's his perspective on how to stay away from mediocrity, but also echoes what I was saying earlier from Tarantino's perspective about your art creating conversation. And another email was to the GM of the Travel Channel, Pat Young, who I mentioned earlier, that reads, the new title sequence, which you promised me would be modern, hip, edgy, is in fact dated, trite, and wouldn't have been edgy in 1962. I do not know the ninth circle of hell that the creators of this abomination inhabit, but I feel my enthusiasm for this project draining by the pint. Best Tony. Do you really mean his best in these? <laughs> Hard to tell. But Sandy Zerwick, who was a, a series producer on No Reservations and Parts Unknown, says he was very decisive. He stood by what he believed in. He knew who he was. He knew what he wanted from the show and he delivered. I wasn't always in 100% agreement with him creatively, but it was clear that he had a vision for it. And that vision reflected who he was and that this was not the case with most people on television. 
I think this whole television stigma, by the way, is really interesting. It's almost seen as less than at times. You know, 10 plus years ago, actors would actually be scared of doing TV series. I know that's not the case now, but there was definitely a time where they were scared by it, that it might prevent them from landing larger movie roles. But it was exactly this undermining of TV that allowed shows like, you know, if you recall House of Cards, you know, in, in the beginnings of Netflix, really to take the spotlight and capitalize on this underserved art form. And I think that's exactly what Tony Bourdain did. But the big insight here is really to expect the best from your art. And that once you see how good something can get, never to let it fall to mediocrity. You know, this, this really can't go underappreciated. Tony did this for years. You know, he did it for years and he kept it at this high, consistent quality level. You know, Charlie Munger says this about business. He said, it's not about getting rich that you have to worry about. It's about staying sane. You know, most people get into something because they're excited by it, but then their attention dwindles, they get bored. But Tony held up a high standard across three different TV travel shows. So just keep in mind how long he was able to keep this standard high. And you know, here, this is where I'd say that, you know, you, you can't deny that Anthony Bourdain has a lot of incredible traits that helped him make great art. But I think that there are a few that whilst they did contribute to his art, also had negative consequences on his personal life. And this is what makes studying Anthony Bourdain so interesting and complicated because firstly, there was that that he needed or he felt he needed to be his character. Philip Lejeune, who we mentioned earlier, you know, he says, after Kitchen Confidential was published, in a very acute way, he tried matching the persona for himself. Now we could hear him screaming in the kitchen, which had never happened. He would throw things in the kitchen, which had never happened. But funny enough, I could tell that this was just a game. In other words, it was not natural. He was trying to scream, but shyly. He was throwing something, but being very careful not to hurt anyone. He was exactly how he described cooks and chefs in the book. But that was not at all who he was. Even the vocabulary kind of changed. He was using stronger words. And throughout this episode, I've not really touched on Anthony Bourdain's drug addiction, but this was a prominent part of his life experiences and lifestyle, particularly when he was a chef. And I hadn't touched on it because this is really about his life as an artist, but Robert Vorlo, the kitchen colleague we mentioned earlier, makes one interesting comment about this in the book, which is he says, Tony, his addictions were always odd to me. I'm going to be somewhat frank here. It felt often part of a persona that he wanted to portray for himself. He sort of constructed this image of himself that he wanted to perpetuate. And it involves this streety kind of edge of the law. I wouldn't say gangster, but he romanticized that kind of lifestyle. Tony was always playing with how he looked to other people. He was very conscious of it. There was this little bit of distance between the things he did and who he was. And it's interesting, right? Because this idea of being conscious of your perception or how people perceive you is a quality of some artists that I really admire. For example, 50 Cent, who was featured in the first episode, had this masterful control over his perception. But the one thing he never did was fall for his own bullshit, if you will. He never fell for the image he was trying to create. He understood that that was an image, but that the real person behind that was another person. It seems that perhaps at times, Antin Bourdain was desperate to be his character, or that he couldn't almost believe that he and his character were separate. He wanted them to be integrated. And unfortunately, the saddest part of this is when after Kitchen Confidential comes out, he actually begins to completely distance himself from all those whom he called friends before the book. There's almost a whole page in the book dedicated to the accounts of his previous colleagues and friends who felt close to him, but upon Tony becoming famous, wouldn't be able to get a call returned or in one instance would be expected to carry things for him as though Tony was now too good to help carry it with them. Tony and Chris Collins actually end up having a huge fight on the first day of shooting a pilot for their new TV show, you know, a year after filming had ended on their run of a cook's tour. So we're talking about no reservations here. And the pilot was being filmed in Paris. It was at this point that Tony had what Lydia Tanaglia described as this existential crisis she actually recalls him saying this is all bullshit i don't know what this is what am i a tv personality now 
This is him talking after he'd done many seasons of his first show. And and whilst Chris, uh, you know, had effectively, you know, brought him back from the ledge and said, you know, pull it together. Somebody paid for us to be here. You better get your head around this thing. There was still this 45 minute postponement to the filming and production of this brand new show, even though everyone is out on location. An insight might be that, you know, sure, Tony wasn't the most emotionally mature at times. And true, he could have had these thoughts before they kind of collected the check and traveled to Paris and brought along the TV crew. But there was something important in him asking himself who he was going to be in the next experience. He had at this point just divorced with his high school sweetheart, his his first wife. And, and I think that his world was now completely different to what it used to be and was not one that was consistent or familiar with the one he was in before. You know, he's no longer working as a chef. He was no longer with his wife. You know, he was in a different place. And so, you know, no wonder he was having this crisis, right? But I do think of the late Chadwick Boseman, another artist I'd love to cover in this show, who said, for me, it's always been, who am I first? I have to know who I am first to know how to navigate this thing. Because if I'm navigating and I become something that I'm not supposed to become, then I'm in the wrong place, whether I've made it in other people's eyes or not. And this, you know, this idea that absolutely love of, you know, becoming this person that maybe you're not supposed to be or being in the wrong person because you, you didn't ask yourself first who you wanted to be. You know, this reminds me of Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher's idea that, you know, the lonely one offers his hand too quickly to whomever he encounters. But, you know, whilst he uses the word lonely one here, I could say that this would also apply to the ambitious but ultimately aimless individual, right? Someone who hasn't developed a base of confidence from which to be able to say no to certain opportunities before they get led astray. So it seems that some part of Tony, some part inside Tony knew this and wanted him to think deeply and act cautiously. But his insecurities perhaps were also drove this. You know, Helen Lang is quoted in the book talking about a dinner she had with Tony after Kitchen Confidential was published, where Tony apparently said, the brass ring comes around only once and I'm going to grab it with both hands. You know, to this, Helen says, he knew it was his big opportunity and he might not get another one. The first wife that Bourdain had just divorced with said he didn't want to slow down. He thought everything was going to be taken away from him real quick, that he had 15 minutes. And Daniel Halpern, who was Tony's editor and publishing partner, said it was as if he felt all of this was happening and he could see it happening, but he didn't deserve it. It's a shame. This is, this is a deep insecurity, I think, of his. He said, and it seemed that to be right at the heart of so much of his effect, he couldn't believe he was anti-Bourdain. And the quote continues, he was always kind of easygoing, but really, when you're with him, at least in my experience, he was uncomfortable enough with himself that you felt uncomfortable. It would be taxing, actually, to spend two or three hours with him because you felt that there was part of him that didn't want you to be there and that he'd rather just be alone. And I find there's this fascinating contrast, something I've really spent a lot of time dwelling on, is this fascinating contrast he has between his desire to become famous, but also his strong desire to constantly be alone. And that's where I think he is naturally an introvert, and yet he has this constant desire and need to be famous. It's almost like he wanted the idea and image of him to be this core, I don't give a fuck attitude persona, and he wanted that to be famous, but not his true, perhaps more insecure self. It's worth noting as well that his dreams were also a little childish. You know, Joel Rose mentions at one point, his writer friend, that he dreamed of living a life that he wrote later about, that his dream one day was to be able to just lie on the beach and have a cocktail in some shack in the sand. But this is the sort of escape and dream that someone who has pain within them has usually. And there's definitely a lot of pain within Bourdain and there's definitely a need to escape. He has this one artistic friend called David Cho and he says to David Cho in, a, in an episode of one of his travel shows, he says, do you think a certain level of dissatisfaction or unhappiness are an essential part to the creative process? David then replies, I think even great art can be created when you're happy, but I think the best art in the universe is created through intense suffering. So then do you put yourself in a situation where you're constantly in pain? And the answer to that question is yes. 
Tony then responds to this and says, that's just about everybody I know. And the thing is, when you read this book about him, you realize that's not true, but perhaps it was true of Tony. Nancy Bourdain, his first wife, said there were times where Tony would want to just go to the movies. It didn't matter what movie, any movie. Looking back, I realized this was an escape. He just couldn't handle whatever he wanted to tell me or not tell me or whatever was going on. He would go to a movie and really get taken away. And so an, an insight for us all here is to not let our own art be an escape. Tony's desire to create the kind of beauty that he saw in movies constantly did lead him to creating ma magnificent art, you know, don't get me wrong. But it did also kind of lead him to believe that his life, which was filled with boring, normal people's stuff, was not good enough. And everything had to be perfect. He had to have this bigger than normal life and a life that kind of took him away from his family for over two thirds of a year at times, you know, particularly with his second wife and his child that he had. So, you know, it, it is something to be conscious of. But this is where, unfortunately, Anthony Bourdain's story has a tragic end. In 2018, at the age of 61, he committed suicide by hanging himself whilst filming a new episode of Parts Unknown in France. And I'd rather recommend at this point watching the documentary or reading the book to get more about this, as I don't want to speak too much as this is a podcast about the philosophy and process behind the icon's work rather than just, you know, stories of their lives. But Tony's life is an important cautionary tale, one for us artists to learn from, as it seems to me that his end was actually entwined with his artistic perspective. Anthony Bourdain, at the time of his suicide, was in a romantic relationship that from the accounts of many in the book, he was obsessed in. After his first two divorces, that's right, two divorces, arriving at the age of 60, he was seen to have been in a quite a dark place. Then suddenly he completely flipped and found himself in a new relationship that gave him new life and energy. And he had her come and direct some of the TV show, which breathed new life into his artistic attitude. Although this did also cause complications with those who he'd been working with for over 20 years, you know, causing him to even fire his cinematographer due to conflicts between them and Tony's new girlfriend. Ultimately, this was another new story for him to involve himself in. And a parts unknown co-worker theorizes that Bourdain, remember a recovering heroin addict, turned a lifelong addictive personality to another person, and that was extremely dangerous. Then, whilst filming this new episode of Parts Unknown, a tabloid printed photo suggesting that Tony's girlfriend was cheating on him with a French reporter, holding hands and hugging together in Rome. Producer Helen Cho noted that if you look at his last Instagram story, he played the title sequence music from the 70s film Violent City. And if you've seen the film, you know that the beginning is a series of paparazzi photos of this couple. It's about this woman who betrays him and him seeking revenge. I feel it important to kind of speak on this because it's such a big part of Anthony Bourdain's story. But instead of pulling some insight or making further analysis, I want to instead read you two important quotes from Philip Lejeune. I, I told you he was an important character, but he says, as a, as a close friend of Tony's, when you choose to hang yourself, it's a form of torture, a self-imposed torture. And the second quote from Philip Lejeune is, he says, I was in Vietnam on a beautiful day. I looked at my phone and there was the news. And that's when I decided to move to Vietnam for good. That was that. It's not even a thought. It was the door opened and I had to go through it and start doing something new. Producer Tom Vitale says at one point how Tony often talked about how in an ideal world, he wouldn't be in the show. It would be his point of view, like a camera moving through space without having to see him at all. And you can see a few episodes of Parts Unknown that really show this. You know, Tony almost is lacking in presence as a character. But I think despite his complex nature, Anthony Bourdain is an essential guide for us. His words, his presence, they bring so much energy into everything he creates from his writing to his TV productions. And whilst he didn't lack in those brash and arrogant characteristics, he did also have moments of great wisdom that made his work move beyond simple fun and adventure. I remember this one episode where upon visiting a family in Laos who had suffered greatly after the war, Tony said, reflecting on kind of how he can use the shows he creates to place a spotlight on those who are usually 
hidden from our screens, the least I can do is to see the world with open eyes. People are not statistics. Surely there is value in showing the little things. And this reminds me of a similar wisdom pursued in Princess Mononoke by Hayao Miyazaki, we mentioned in the last episode, which was this idea to see with eyes unclouded. Sometimes I think you have to leave in order to find the beauty in what you've left. And I believe Tony, through his work, did exactly this. He says, travel changes you. As you move through this life and this world, you change things slightly. You leave marks behind, however small. And in return, life and travel leaves marks on you. Tony gave us a lot of truth to contemplate. But I'll end this episode with one I hope we can all touch in our lives. He said, To sit alone with a few friends, half drunken under a full moon, you just understand how lucky you are. It's a story you almost by definition can't share. I've learned in real time to look at those things and realize I just had a really good moment. You know, I mentioned that during the pandemic, Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown was how I traveled. But in preparation for this podcast, I watched episodes from his two other shows and reread a lot of his writing. So if you're curious as to what I think is the best piece of art Anthony Bourdain ever made, I made a free downloadable PDF available in the link in the podcast show notes where I talk about the piece and dissect it. And you also get a summary of the learnings from this episode. But with that, I've been Justin Campbell-Platt. This is Icons. Thank you for listening.